Hello, Glenmar. It's such a pleasure to be able to do this. I think uh, Word on Wednesday is such a terrific idea. I'm sure a lot of us might be feeling a bit sick of technology at this point, um, but I remind myself every day how lucky I am to have access to the internet when so many in the world are sheltering in place with little to no connection to their friends or family or the church. Um, technology really is such a gift. Uh, my name is Alex Thomas. I'm a proud Glenmar Preschool alum, uh, back when we were on, actually on Glenmar Road. Uh, some of you may remember me running around the hallways as a teenager in youth group, and I hope maybe you all forgot about the time I asked everyone to donate underwear for a mission trip project in a ridiculous video that uh, somehow got permission to be shown during worship. <laughs> uh, I haven't been around much lately. I went off to college um, across the country, and then I did a year-long service program in Los Angeles working um, among folks experiencing homelessness. And I've been living in North Carolina the last three years working on my master's in divinity. I just graduated, so they say. Uh, I mean, there's nothing to commemorate it but a virtual diploma, uh, but it feels great to be done. Uh, as I've been exploring my faith, becoming a part of so many different communities and learning about God, the church, and how to do ministry, I've kept uh, this guy Nubs with me, my little dinosaur. Uh, I got him at a Walmart in Slidell, Louisiana, on a church mission trip almost 10 years ago, which is unbelievable. Um, besides being super cute and compact, he's easy to, to carry around. Um, I've always seen him as a loving reminder of my faith community that raised me and encouraged my strong interest in ministry. I'm incredibly grateful for your support of me over the last few years, and I feel beyond lucky to have had so many opportunities to grow as a servant of God when I was just a curious kid asking people to donate underwear. I'm still very curious, and I always will be, which is why taking classes on the Bible and theology and all sorts of things was so fun for me. Something that got drilled into my head and into my heart in all of my classes is the idea that Christians should carry their Bibles in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Um, I would hold a newspaper, but I read the news on my phone, <laughs> which is recording this. Uh, we should be interpreting what's going on in the world in light of scripture and then faithfully responding as one body in Christ. I often find myself unable to read the Bible without what's going on in the world acting as a kind of lens. I see the word of God through experience which is very Methodist of me. I've been reading scripture lately with this pandemic, the economy's collapse, and police brutality and communities of color all at the forefront of my mind. So it seems natural that the Spirit has been leading me to Job, which is an Old Testament book about an ordinary guy who has a bone to pick with God after his life becomes unbearable. Job loses his family, his farm, his livelihood, his health, and he even loses his will to keep living. Job's story is a reminder of how fast things can fall apart. Job's story speaks into our world today. The poetry of Job gives words to so many of the hard questions that have troubled humanity forever. It's a high stakes debate on why injustice reigns in the world. It's a wrestling with what it means to have faith in an all powerful God when so many suffer and don't deserve it. Job really gets it. There's no sugarcoating. Job refuses to believe that everything happens for a reason. 
he insists over and over again that his complaints are valid. As I've been journeying with Job recently, I've been thinking about his story in light of people dying of the coronavirus, overburdened healthcare workers, people who have suddenly lost their jobs and their livelihoods, and communities of color mourning and expressing outrage over the many ways the violence of racism continues to loom large. All of these things have been swirling together in my head. And I wanna be clear and say that there's a difference between the injustice that Job is experiencing and sin. People of color suffer under the sin of racism in this country, and the coronavirus is exposing sin as well. The poorest among us have been most adversely affected by the virus, people without health insurance, people without easy access to health care, people who have to put themselves at risk and continue working low-wage jobs to deliver supplies, stock the shelves, and package meat in factories. The coronavirus is not the great equalizer. It's easy to expose sin, and honestly, the nice thing about it is that we can then address it. We can reform the way policing is done. We can make healthcare more accessible. The injustice in Job's story is different. He doesn't lose everything because of his sin. He's a righteous guy. He's lived a good life, and he's been faithful to God. There's no logic to his suffering, no reason for it. This is the injustice of living in a world where horrifying viruses can pop up out of nowhere, viruses that affect the most vulnerable among us. It's unjust that older and immunocompromised people suffer the most. It's unjust that people who were working hard in stable jobs before the pandemic had to suddenly lose them. None of that is a result of sin. As someone not experiencing suffering like Job's, I've been thinking a lot about his friends, Alifa's, Bildad, and Zophar. Job is a man in crisis who clearly need what ministers call pastoral care, and I'd like to dive into how I see Job's friends doing and not doing pastoral care. I'm fortunate to be doing a program called Clinical Pastoral Education right now. It's a program in hospitals around the country that teaches ministers in training, like myself, how to be a pastoral presence for people. I wear this badge that says chaplain. It really should say chaplain intern. <laughs> Um, and I roam around hospital hallways visiting patients. I've also been visiting folks in hospice, um, people who are hours or days away from death. It's been my perception so far that everyone's suffering has been exacerbated by the pandemic, the economy, and the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery. I, uh, I actually watched part of George Floyd's funeral with a black woman in her hospital room last week, and she said to me, they just keep killing us. My heart breaks for George's six-year-old daughter who has to grow up without a father. When I go into a room and see a person clearly in pain, a person in distress, a person who seems lonely because the hospital is limiting visitors right now. My gut instinct is to sit in silence with them, to be a witness to their suffering. And that's why I actually really like what Job's friends do right off the bat. We read in Job chapter three, they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw his suffering was very great. After seven days of that, they switched tactics. 
here are just a few things that Job's friends say to him, and these are the messages translations. Do you think you're the first person to have to deal with these things? You've incriminated yourself. It's plain your children sinned against God. Otherwise, why would God have punished them? Why do you let your emotions take over? You're a first-class moral failure. There's no end to your sins. You can be sure of this. You haven't gotten half of what you deserve. Oh, my. Job's friends are a great example of how the Bible doesn't always give us examples of faithful living and in fact, the Bible is full of people we should not be modeling after. Job's friends, although I think they lose their friend status uh, very quickly, are saying these things because they believe one thing. Only people who sin get punished. They're trying to explain logic into Job's situation when there is none. We all sin and arbitrary injustice is a reality in this world. Bad things happen to good people. I thought going into my chaplaincy program that I could avoid making these mistakes by just doing the right thing. The things that, or the thing that the friends do first, which is to sit in silence with people. I can do that. But in orientation, my supervisor said, the vast majority of what you'll do is listen. You can't just listen though, you have to respond. And you can't just ask questions, you have to really respond, make statements, show people that you've been listening. Your care becomes real when you respond. I had no idea what that meant or how to do that, but thankfully, I got a chance to observe my supervisor in action on my first day at the hospital. We got a call to visit a woman who had just had a miscarriage. And I followed my supervisor down lots of hallways. I still get lost there. And we soon got to a hallway where we could hear someone crying through the open door of a room. Uh, and so we walked in, we sat down, and we introduced ourselves. and. This woman told us about how this was her fifth miscarriage and she was close to giving up hope. Um, in between sobs, she, she said God had a plan for her and she knew it would be okay. She just needed to get it together enough to get out to her car and, and tell her husband what had happened. My supervisor listened and nodded and asked a few questions. I noticed she kept saying, I know I'll be fine. I know I'll be fine. And she kept moving her mask down to, to blow her nose. My supervisor then said, it's clear you have such strong faith and that's wonderful. I think though, you can grieve right now. You can be upset. You can be sad. God is sad with you. She looked at him like those were the exact words she needed to hear. He didn't try to explain why the miscarriage happened, and he didn't say it had to have happened for some reason or another. He just simply told her she could be sad. That's pastoral care. Since pastor is in the word pastoral, it might be tempting to think that only pastors are called to pastoral care. Actually, all Christians are called to follow Christ's example, and that means being with people who are suffering. Right now, that might look like calling people on the phone or hopping on Zoom. At the hospital, uh, I'm not allowed to physically visit people who are in contact isolation, so I called them from the chaplain's office, and I've been really surprised at how the Holy Spirit can move through phone cords. Uh, I shouldn't be, I know the Spirit is in and around us all the time. Technology is a gift we can all use. And pastoral care is the duty of all of us within Christ's body. We are all called to be with people in their despair. We are called to channel Christ's compassion, to shine forth as beacons of hope, especially during these times of extreme grief 
and sadness and anguish. We can't shine Christ's light if we're too busy trying to explain why suffering exists. And as I've learned, we also can't shine Christ's light if we stay silent. Job's friends aren't channeling God's love to Job because they aren't letting Job complain and be sad. They aren't truly being with him. I should mention that God condemns Job's friends. Right at the end of the book, God says to the friends, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. In other words, you guys have failed at being good and faithful friends to Job because you spoke ill of me. Job's friends do not represent God, and they clearly misunderstand God's justice. We believe in a God who took on human flesh and suffered alongside us. A God who weeps with us. A God who is always present with us in our pain. God gives us permission to be sad because God is sad with us. God weeps with us because God knows our suffering. And thanks be to God for that. And before I close, I'd like to offer a word of prayer. Good and gracious and ever-loving God, we come before you today with gratitude for your word and that we can take comfort in it. We know, as Job knows, that our Redeemer lives. You live within us. Your light shines forth in our hearts. Help us be good stewards of that light. Help us build courage to be with your suffering people. Help us offer faithful pastoral care and guide us not in figuring out how to say the right thing, but how to say the loving and faithful thing. In your name we pray. Amen.